control and coordination animals and plants produce responses to stimuli shivering to cold weather here cold weather is the stimuli and the response is shivering a plant bending towards sunlight in this case sunlight is the stimulus and bending of plant is the response mouth watering to an ice cream in this case ice cream is the stimuli and salivation that is mouth watering is the response school principal sudden visit to the classroom if this is your stimuli what would be your response write it in the comment box but why do organisms produce responses to stimuli most of the responses produced by the organisms protect them from the dangerous stimuli but which systems help the organisms to produce responses to stimuli nervous system and hormonal systems help the organisms to produce responses to stimuli nerve cells play an important role in detecting the stimuli nerve cells are also called as neurons each neuron has different parts like cell body nucleus dendrites axon and nerve endings the neurons that are present in the sense organs have specialized tips called as receptors these receptors detect the stimuli and converts it into electrical impulses so we have different types of receptors in our body some receptors detect the smell some receptors detect the pain some detect the temperature some detect the taste the receptors that are present in the nose are called olfactory receptors they help in detecting the smell the receptors that are present in our tongue which helps in detecting the taste are called as gustatory receptors the information that is collected by the receptors is carried by the neurons to other parts of the nervous system so the neurons carry the information to different parts of the nervous system this is called as nerve conduction the neurons collect the nerve impulses by their dendrites and pass them to the other neurons by their nerve endings so the collection of nerve impulses takes place at the dendrites and passing of nerve impulses to the next neuron by their nerve endings but here the nerve endings of one neuron and dendrites of another neuron are not directly attached to one another there is some gap between them this junction is called as synapse if the endings of one neuron and the starting of another neuron if they are not directly connected then how the conduction of nerve impulse takes place how the signals pass from one neuron to another neuron if there is such gap see at the end of the nerve terminals of a neuron the electrical impulses are converted into chemical signals this chemical signal is in the form of a gas it crosses the gap and reaches the dendrites of another neuron there it is again converted to electrical signal the neurons that carry the information from sense organs to brain or spinal cord or called sensory neurons sensory neurons usually carry the information about the stimuli the neurons that carry the information from brain or spinal cord to muscles or glands are called motor neurons so these neurons they bring the orders from the brain or spinal cord to different body parts and here there are two pathways in which responses are produced to stimuli in our body in one pathway information about the stimulus passes to spinal cord and then from spinal cord to brain now the response is generated in the brain that means the processing of information about the stimulus takes place in the brain now the brain processes the information and it produces some response it gives some orders which are passed down to the spinal cord and again from spinal cord they are finally reached to the muscles this is a long pathway and it takes considerable amount of time to produce responses because the information has to pass first to spinal cord then to brain 
again from brain to spinal cord and spinal cord to the target tissues. But in some situations, organisms need to produce very quick responses to protect themselves from the dangerous stimuli. For example, when we touch a hot object, we should remove our hand immediately. There is no such long time to think and take the decisions. In such cases, our body takes a short pathway. In this pathway, information about the stimuli passes to the spinal cord where it is processed quickly and the responses are produced in the spinal cord itself. Now these responses directly reach the muscles and it causes immediate movements and protects us. This kind of quick responses are called reflex actions. So the pathway by which a reflex action is executed is called reflex arc. Now let's see the different parts of this reflex arc. It has got receptors which receive the information about the stimuli and sensory neurons which carry this information from receptor to the spinal cord and relay neurons. So these neurons they process the information about the stimuli and produce the responses and these responses are carried by the motor neurons. So the motor neurons they carry these responses from spinal cord to the effector. Affector means it can be either muscles or glands. That is the final organ where the movement takes place. So these are the components of the reflex arc and this is how a reflex arc functions. The nervous system is divided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system, it consists of brain and spinal cord. Whereas the peripheral nervous system, it consists of nerves. Brain is an important and delicate organ of our body. It has to be protected from injuries and shocks and blows. Our brain is covered by a fluid-filled balloon-like structure. This structure is made up of three layers. These layers are called meninges. And between the meninges, there is a kind of fluid. The fluid present between these layers is called cerebrospinal fluid. So, these meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid protects the brain from shocks and injuries. Brain along with the meninges is protected by an outer bony case called as cranium. In general terms, it is called as skull. It is a hard bony structure that protects the brain from shocks and injuries. Brain is the main coordinating center of our body. It receives the information from all parts of our body and integrates it. The main functions of our brain are thinking, decision making, storing information, producing emotions and controlling body functions both voluntary and involuntary. The functions that are under our will are called voluntary functions. Examples like writing, talking, dancing, clapping. These are the examples of voluntary functions which are controlled by our brain. The actions that are not under our control are called involuntary actions like digestion, heartbeat, sneezing. These are the some examples of involuntary actions which are controlled by human brain and spinal cord. Now let us see which part of the brain controls which functions. The brain has three main parts, namely the forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain. Forebrain the thought process takes place in the forebrain. It has regions which receive sensory impulses from various receptors. The forebrain has different centers for hearing, smell, sight, etc. The information from different sense organs is analyzed and compared with the information already stored in our brain. Based on the analysis, the forebrain takes a decision and sends it to the area of the brain which controls the movements of our voluntary muscles. For example, if we are playing football, our eye sends the information about the position of the ball to the area of the brain which analyzes it. After analysis, a decision is taken and the information is sent to the area of the brain which executes it. It causes the necessary movements in our muscles and makes us kick the ball in right direction with right force. The sensation of hunger and feeling full is also controlled by a separate area of forebrain. Next, we see midbrain. 
Midbrain controls the visual and auditory reflexes. That means it controls the reflexes related to vision and hearing. It also has center for controlling the movements of our eye and eyelids. Hindbrain. Hindbrain has three parts, namely pons, medulla oblongata, and cerebellum. These parts control the involuntary functions of our body. Pons controls sleep and wake cycle and breathing. Medulla controls heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, and more involuntary functions. Cerebellum. It is responsible for precision of voluntary actions and maintaining posture and balance of the body, like walking in a straight line, riding a bicycle, drawing an art. All these are possible because of cerebellum. Coordination in plants. Do plants respond to stimuli? Yes, plants respond to stimuli like sunlight, water, soil, touch, chemicals, etc. But most of these responses are in the form of movements. That means plants show movements for sunlight, water, soil, touch, and chemicals. For example, stems bending towards sunlight. We observe this phenomena. Plant stems bend towards sunlight. And roots of the plants, they grow towards the soil or water. And tendrils of the plants, which have weak stems, like creepers, we can observe that the tendrils of the plants coil around the support. And we also observe the closing of leaves of touch-me-not plant when it is touched. So all these are the responses that are produced in the form of movements. Then how do plants produce movements? We know that animals produce movements with the help of nervous system and muscular system. But plants do not have neither nervous system nor a muscular system, like in animals to produce movements. The movements in plants are caused either by growth or by changing the shape of the cell. Now let us see which movements in plants are caused due to growth. The movements in plant pots like stem moving towards sunlight, roots growing towards soil, and tendrils coiling around some support, and the pollen tube from the pollen grain growing towards the ovule, all these are caused due to growth. In fact, these movements are the responses for different stimuli. The directional movements that are shown by plants in response to environmental stimuli are called tropic movements. Movement of plant parts towards sunlight is called phototrophism. Example, stem bending towards light. So this phenomenon is called phototropism. And movement of plant parts towards the soil is called geotropism. Example, roots growing towards soil. And movement of plant parts towards the water is called hydrotropism. Example, roots they grow towards water, they move towards water. And movement of plant parts in the direction of an object that it touches is called thigmotrophism. Here the example, tendrils coiling around the support. And movement of plant parts towards a chemical stimulus is called chemotropism. So this is observed in pollen tube. The pollen tube, it grows towards the ovule. When a pollen grain reaches the stigma of a flower, the pollen grain germinates and it grows the pollen tube. Now let's see what causes the tropic movements in plants. Tropic movements in plants are caused due to some special compounds called as phytohormones, means plant hormones. For example, if a plant tip has to bend towards the right, that is right side, the cells in the left side part of the tip get elongated. So when the left side cells are elongated, the right side cells are in the normal size, what happens? It makes the plant bend towards right. The elongation of cells in the left half of the plant tip is caused by a phytohormone called as auxin. This plant hormone, auxin, helps in the elongation of cells in one side. So it leads to bending of the tip. In this way, the movements are caused by the hormones. 
Now let us see some major phytohormones and their functions. The five major phytohormones are auxins, gibberellins, cytokinins, ethylene and abscisic acid. First we see auxins. Auxins stimulate the cells to grow longer. They make the cells grow longer and they are responsible for tropic movements in plants. We have seen some tropic movements in plants like phototrophism, zeotrophism, this kind of tropic movements. So, auxin is responsible for that tropic movements. And these auxins, they are mostly concentrated in the young root and shoot tips. So, auxins are found in the root tips and in shoot tips. Next, gibberellins. Gibberellins helps in the stem and root elongation in plants. They also help in the plant growth. They help in the elongation of stem and root. Cytokinins. Cytokinins promote cell division. They help in the cell division. Cell division means formation of new cells. So when new cells are formed, that is called as growth. The weight, the mass of the plant increases, the size of the plant increases. And these cytokinins are mostly found in fruits, seeds. In fruits and seeds, rapid cell division takes place. The size of the fruit increases day by day till it completely grown. So how the size of the fruit increases? By repeated cell divisions. So the cell divisions are promoted by which hormone? Cytokinin. And next, abscisic acid. This hormone acts as a growth inhibitor. Inhibitor means which stops. So abscisic acid stops the growth. So this hormone helps in the wilting of leaves. When the leaves become old, they turn yellow in color. Finally, they get detached from the stem and falls down. So this process is initiated by this hormone abscisic acid and ethylene. Ethylene is a phytohormone. It stimulates ripening of fruits. Once the fruit is completely grown, then the fruit it gets ripened. The ripening of fruit takes place and it is activated by the hormone ethylene. So this is all about the plant hormones. Now let us see the hormones in animals. We have seen that control and coordination in animals is done by the nervous system. But there is another system that helps in coordination in animals. So what is that second way of control and coordination in animals? In animals, the second way of control and coordination is done by endocrine system. That is hormonal system. The endocrine system is composed of various endocrine glands like pituitary gland, thyroid gland, adrenal gland, pancreas, testis and ovaries. These are endocrine glands. We have some other glands in our body like liver, salivary glands. Those are not endocrine glands. Those are exocrine glands. These are endocrine glands. So the glands that secrete the hormones are called endocrine glands. So all these glands, they secrete some special chemical compounds called hormones. Now let's see what are the functions of hormones and how they are supplied to different parts of our body. Hormones help to control many body functions such as growth, repair and reproduction. Hormones are secreted by glands in very small quantity. Hormones are produced in very, very small quantities. Then how these hormones reach different parts of our body? These hormones reach different parts of our body through blood circulatory system. But here we are learning that the hormone is secreted in very minute quantity. If it is secreted into the bloodstream, then it gets supplied to all the body parts. How does it work? Let's see. Once a hormone is released into the bloodstream, it is supplied to all the body parts. But it acts only on the target tissue or organ. That means, if the hormone, it has to work on kidneys, even though it is supplied to all the body parts, other body parts will not accept it. Only the target organ, which organ needs that hormone, it accepts it. So, in such a way, hormones are supplied by the blood circulatory system. How do hormones help our body in producing a response towards a stimulus? Let's understand the functioning of hormones with an example. If a person is attacked by a dog, then he should either fight with the dog or run away from the dog. So here, the dog's attack is the stimulus and the man running 
or escaping is the response. In such a situation, a hormone called adrenaline is secreted by adrenal glands in our body. Adrenal glands are present on the top of the kidneys. So this kind of situation is called as fight or flight situation. So when we are in such a danger situation, fight or flight situation, that means we have to fight with the dog or flight, run away from the dog. So for both the processes, either to fight or to flight, our muscles need large amounts of glucose and oxygen. Then how do the large amount of glucose comes to our muscles to do either fight or flight? It is done by the adrenaline. The main function of adrenaline is to increase the supply of oxygen and glucose to our skeletal muscles. So because in such a situation, our muscles need lot of glucose and oxygen either to fight or flight. So the supply of glucose is stimulated by the adrenal hormone. Even though adrenaline is supplied to all the parts of our body, only few organs accept it and functions accordingly. Adrenaline mainly affects our eyes, blood vessels, heart, lungs and muscles. Due to the action of adrenaline, our heart beats faster and supplies more oxygen to our muscles. So when we are frightened, we observe that our heart beats fast. Why it is beating fast? Because to pump more oxygen, more glucose to the muscles. And also, the blood from the digestive system and skin is taken and sent to the muscles. So the blood in the digestive system and skin is reduced and it is diverted to the muscles. So our muscles will be rushed with more blood, more oxygen, more glucose because they have some emergency. Adrenaline also increases the breathing rate by increasing the muscular movements of diaphragm and rib muscles. So adrenaline increases the breathing rate. Not only the heartbeat, the breathing rate is also increased. We breathe a lot. So this breathing rate is increased by the muscular movements of diaphragm and rib muscles. That is also done by the adrenaline. So this is how adrenaline helps us to produce a response during a dangerous or harmful stimuli. So this response is to protect us from the danger. So why is it important to have iodized salt in our diet and how is it connected to our endocrine system? So we see the ads, it is advised to consume iodized salt in place of normal salt because iodine is an important mineral required for our body. Do you know why iodine is necessary? Iodine is essential for making a hormone called as thyroxine. This hormone is produced by thyroid gland which is present at the neck region. The main function of this thyroxine is to control the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. So these are the nutrients that we obtain from the food. So the metabolism of these nutrients is controlled by this thyroxine hormone. So that means our food intake and body growth are well balanced by this hormone. If we do not have sufficient iodine in our diet, it may lead to low production of thyroxine and causes a disease called gaiter. So the main symptom of this disease is swollen neck. Next, which hormone is responsible for our growth? Growth hormone secreted by pituitary gland is responsible for regular body growth. The growth of skeletal muscles and bone is under the control of growth hormone. So we say, when a person's muscles and bones are growing and he is becoming tall, then we say he is growing. So growth is observed in teenagers. They grow very fast. In their body, we can see the growth of skeletal muscles and bones growing, their height increasing. This is all happens because of a hormone called growth hormone. The deficiency of this growth hormone leads to a condition called dwarfism. So if the growth hormone is not produced, they do not grow at a normal rate and they become very short. So their growth is stunted. This condition is called dwarfism. In some people, overproduction of growth hormone takes place. The overproduction of growth hormone leads to a condition called gigantism. So gigantism means zaint. He becomes a zaint, more than the normal height. Usually people grow 
up to some 6 feet or 6 point some inches. But some people may grow beyond that, 7 feet more than that. So it's all because of overproduction of growth hormone. So this condition is called as gigantism. So low production of growth hormone, dwarfism. Overproduction of growth hormone, gigantism. Next, which hormone is called the male hormone and why is it called so? Testosterone is called as male sex hormone. It is called so because it helps in the development of secondary sexual characters like growth of moustache, growth of beard, development of testes and production of sperms in boys. Which hormone is called female sex hormone and why is it called so? Estrogen is called as female sex hormone. It is called so because it helps in the development of secondary sexual characters in females like development of breasts, beginning of menstruation, development of ovaries, etc. Why do doctors suggest some people to eat less sugars and starchy foods in their diet? Doctors suggest some people to eat less sugary and starchy foods because they are suffering from a disease called as diabetes. Our blood contains glucose. The normal level of glucose in our blood is 99 mg per 100 ml of blood. If our blood glucose level rises, then a hormone called insulin is secreted by our pancreas. This insulin controls the raising blood sugar levels. But in some people, due to the malfunctioning of insulin producing cells of pancreas, less insulin is produced, which leads to a high level of blood sugar. Such a condition is called diabetes. High levels of blood sugar causes harmful effects on our body. Diabetic people are more prone to the diseases related to heart, kidney, eye and nerve. Types of Reproduction Reproduction is of two types, asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. First, let us learn about asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction means the reproduction that takes place without the fusion of sex cells or gametes. Only one parent is involved in this type of reproduction. So, asexual reproduction is a process that involves a single parent and no fertilization or gamete formation takes place. Asexual reproduction is observed in both unicellular and in multicellular organisms. First, let us see the different modes of asexual reproduction in unicellular organisms. Binary fission. Binary means two. Fission means splitting. In this mode of reproduction, one parent organism splits into two daughter organisms. This type of asexual reproduction is observed in single-celled organisms like amoeba, bacteria and euglena. Here we have two unicellular organisms. This is amoeba and this is leishmania. Leishmania causes Kala Azar disease in humans. Amoeba has no fixed shape to its body. It can change its body shape. The fission in amoeba can take place in any plane because it has no specific shape. Whereas Leishmania splits in a specific direction since it has a specific shape. Multiple fission. Multiple fission means splitting into many. That means one organism splits into many new organisms. Certain single-celled organisms like Plasmodium reproduce by multiple fission. Next one, budding. Yeast is an unicellular fungus. They produce buds on their bodies. These buds get separated and grows into an individual organism. This mode of reproduction is called budding. These are the methods of asexual reproduction in unicellular organisms. Now let us see the methods of asexual reproduction in multicellular organisms. 1. Fragmentation Spirogyra is an algae. It is a multicellular organism with simple body organization. It reproduces by fragmentation. In this method of reproduction, first the organism breaks into fragments and each fragment grows into a new organism. Next, Regeneration Certain multicellular animals have an ability to reproduce from their cut body parts. For example, planaria and hydra. If these organisms are cut into pieces, each piece can grow into a complete individual. This is called regeneration. Next, budding. 
hydra can reproduce by another sexual method of reproduction called budding hydras have regenerative cells in their bodies they use these cells to produce small buds on their bodies these buds grow in size and becomes big they get separated from the parent organism and grows into an individual organism vegetative propagation flower is the reproductive part of the plant whereas stem root branches leaves and buds are vegetative parts of the plant if plants reproduce through their vegetative parts it is called as vegetative propagation cutting layering and grafting are the three major techniques of vegetative propagation sugar canes are grown by stem cuttings roses can be propagated by layering many fruit plants and trees are grown by grafting techniques advantages of vegetative propagation one plants grown through vegetative propagation can flower and fruit sooner than those grown from the seeds two these techniques enable the propagation of seedless plants like bananas oranges roses and jasmine three plants produced through vegetative propagation exhibit genetic similarity to their parent plant ensuring they inherit all of its characteristics next reproduction through leaves in bryophyllum certain buds are produced in the notches of their leaves these buds are called epiphyllous buds when these buds touch the soil they germinate into new plants next spore formation rhizopus a common bread mold reproduces through a process called sporangiospore formation specialized structures known as sporangia develops at the tips of the upright filamentous structures called hyphae inside these sporangia numerous asexual spores called sporangiospores are produced as the sporangium matures it eventually ruptures releasing the spores into the surrounding environment these spores can then disperse and germinate under suitable conditions giving rise to new rhizopus fungi this is all about the asexual reproduction in organisms sexual reproduction in plants flower is the reproductive part of the plant these are sepals these are petals this is pistil pistil is the female reproductive part of the flower and this is stamen it is the male reproductive part of the flower a flower that has both male and female reproductive parts is called bisexual flower example hibiscus mustard a flower that has only either male or female reproductive parts is called as unisexual flower examples papaya and watermelon now let us study the reproductive parts of the flower stamen has two main parts named as anther and filament anther consists of small reproductive units called as pollen grains if we touch the stamen of a flower some yellow colored dust like material sticks to our fingers it is nothing but pollen these pollen grains carry male reproductive cells in them pistil it has three main parts stigma style and ovary the top part of the pistil is called stigma it is sticky in nature the middle long tube like part is the style the bulged bottom part of the pistil is ovary ovules are present inside the ovary each ovule has an egg cell in it pollination for the process of fertilization the pollen grains has to reach from anther to stigma this transfer of pollen grains from stamens to stigma is called pollination if the transfer of pollen grains takes place between the stamen of a flower to the stigma of the same flower or another flower on the same plant it is called self pollination if the transfer of pollen takes place from the stamen of one flower to stigma of another flower on different plant is called cross pollination the pollen grains are carried to the pistil by the help of different agents like wind water insects or animals fertilization once the pollen lands on the sticky stigma the pollen starts germination and produces a long tube called as pollen tube this tube travels through the style and reaches the ovule present inside the ovary the male cells from the pollen grain enters the ovule through this tube the male cell fuses with the egg cell present inside the ovule 
and forms a zygote. This process is called fertilization. After fertilization, the zygote divides several times and forms an embryo. The ovule develops a tough covering around it and it turns into seed. The ovary grows in size and gets ripened to become a fruit. That means after fertilization, the ovule of the flower becomes seed and the ovary becomes fruit. Remaining parts like stigma, style, petals, sepals get dried up and fall off. The seed contains the embryo and when it gets the necessary conditions, then it germinates and grows into a new plant. This is about the sexual reproduction in plants. Now, let us learn about sexual reproduction in human beings. Puberty Human reproduction is sexual type. For sexual reproduction, sex cells or gametes are required. These gametes are produced by the reproductive organs. Male reproductive organs produce male gametes and female reproductive organs produce female gametes. Boys and girls possess reproductive organs by birth, but they do not produce gametes till they attain certain age. The maturation of special tissues present in the reproductive organs takes place between 8 to 13 years of age in girls and 9 to 14 years of age in boys. At this age, along with the production of gametes, certain bodily changes also begin to happen in boys and girls. This is called beginning of puberty. During this process of puberty, a child grows into a complete adult. Puberty ends by 18 to 19 years of age. Puberty is the process of physical changes through which a child's body matures into an adult's body and becomes capable of sexual reproduction. Now let us see what kind of changes takes place in the bodies of boys and girls during puberty. Changes those are common in both boys and girls. 1. Growth of thick hair on new areas of body parts like in armpits and in genital areas between thighs. 2. The skin in these areas becomes darker in color. 3. Growth of thin hair on hands and legs as well as on the face. 4. The skin becomes oilier and may be prone to acne due to increased sebum production. Acne is the common skin condition during puberty. Changes that takes place only in boys during puberty. 1. The voice becomes hoarse and cracked. The Adam's apple becomes more prominent. 2. Thick hair grows on the face and forms moustache and beard. 3. The penis occasionally becomes enlarged and erect. Changes that takes place only in girls during puberty. 1. Breast size begins to increase. 2. The area near the nipples of the breast becomes darker in color. 3. The hips become wider. 4. Menstruation or periods begin. How do these bodily changes help in the process of reproduction? Growth of hair on face and body parts acts as an indication for sexual maturity. Means a sexually matured animal identifies another sexual matured animal for mating with the help of these indications. Mating means the joining of male and female bodies for the deposition of male cells into the female's body. The enlargement and erection of penis helps in the deposition of sperm cells in the female reproductive organs while mating. The hips of the females become wider to facilitate pregnancy and delivery of the baby. The breasts grow in size and matures to feed milk to the newborn babies. This is all about puberty. Human Male Reproductive System Human Male Reproductive System perform three important functions. 1. Production of male gametes or sperm cells. 2. Secretion of male sex hormone that is testosterone. 3. Deposition of gametes in the female reproductive system. There is a pair of testes present in the male reproductive system. The production of male gametes and secretion of male sex hormone is done by testes. Testes are present outside the body cavity. They are located in an elastic sac-like structure called as scrotum. Testis produces the male sex hormone that is testosterone. This hormone helps in the puberty of males. This hormone is responsible for the bodily changes that takes place during puberty. Why the testes are hanging outside the body cavity? 
Because testes cannot produce sperms at the body temperature, they need a low temperature to produce sperms. That is why they are present outside the body cavity. The sperm cells produced by the testes are small and motile, means moving cells. Each sperm cell has a headpiece, middle piece, and a tail. Now the sperms produced by the testes are to be deposited in the female reproductive system to reach the egg cell. Sperms need some accessory materials for the successful journey to the egg cell. Sperms produced in the testes travel through a duct called as vas deferens. At this point, the secretions from seminal vesicles and prostate gland are added to the sperms. These secretions and sperms, together called as semen, these secretions make the movement of sperms smooth and easier. They also provide nourishment to the sperms. This semen passes out through this duct called urethra, which is present inside the penis. Urethra is the common duct for the passage of sperms and urine, but both do not pass at the same time. During mating, the semen, sperms and secretions are deposited in the vagina of the female reproductive system by the penis of the male reproductive system. Human Female Reproductive System Female reproductive system performs four important functions. 1. Production of female gametes or egg cells. 2. Secretion of female hormones that is estrogen and progesterone. 3. Providing necessary conditions for the fertilized egg to develop into a baby. 4. Menstruation First, let us see the production of female gametes or egg cells. This task is done by the ovaries of the female reproductive system. By birth, girls contain a pair of ovaries. Each ovary contains thousands of immature eggs. On reaching puberty, these eggs start maturing and gets released. Each ovary alternately releases one egg approximately every month. The released egg is collected into a tube called as fallopian tubule. The sperms deposited by the male in the vagina during sexual intercourse travels through the cervix, uterus and reaches the egg present in the fallopian tubule. If the sperms fertilize the egg, it becomes zygote. This zygote divides repeatedly and forms an embryo. This embryo moves towards the uterus and get implanted in the wall of the uterus. The lining of the uterus grow new tissues and blood vessels to accommodate the embryo. After implantation, the embryo grows into a fetus. The embryo gets nutrition from the mother's blood with the help of a special tissue called placenta. This is a disc-like structure embedded in the walls of the uterus. This placenta has blood spaces on the mother's side and villi on the fetus side. This arrangement provides large surface area for the exchange of materials between the blood of the mother and the blood of the baby. Here, the nutrients and oxygen are absorbed and wastes are released into the mother's blood. The development of baby inside the mother's womb takes approximately 9 months. This period is called gestation period. The delivery of the baby takes place by the rhythmic contractions of the uterus. What happens if the egg is not fertilized in the fallopian tubule? Every month, the walls of the uterus are get lined by blood vessels and tissues in the anticipation of embryo. If the egg is not fertilized and the embryo is not formed, then the unfertilized egg leaves for one day. After that, the egg gets dissolved and the tissues formed on the lining of the uterus along with the blood, slowly breaks and expels out through the vagina. The loss of blood and mucus from the vagina lasts for 2 to 8 days. This process is called menstruation. Since this process is periodical and happens for every 28 days, it is called as menstrual cycle or periods. This is all about the female reproductive system. Reproductive health a boy has got the capability of producing sperm cells and the production of ovum started in a girl. Does it mean that they both are ready for sexual act to produce babies? No. The mind and body should be completely matured to participate in sexual acts. Otherwise, one needs to face so many complications. Health complications due to sexual acts 
Sexual act involves the intimate contact of body parts, which may leads to the transmission of certain bacterial diseases like gonorrhea and syphilis and viral infections such as warts and HIV AIDS. For girls, getting pregnant at younger age can adversely affect their health. How to avoid these complications? 1. Participating in sexual acts only when the body and mind are completely matured. That is only after crossing 18 years of age. 2. Having sexual relations with a single trustable partner. 3. By using contraceptive devices and methods. Contraceptive devices and methods. Condom. Condom is a rubbery covering that is worn on the penis during intercourse to prevent the entry of sperms into the female reproductive system. It also prevents the transfer of germs between the partners and give protection from sexually transmitted diseases. Copper tea. Copper tea is the other contraceptive device that is placed in the uterus of the females to prevent the fusion of sperm cell and egg cell. This device may cause irritation in some people. Next, contraceptive pills. These are the drugs that change the hormonal balance in the female body and stop the release of eggs. The prolonged use of these pills can cause side effects. Next, surgical methods. The vast difference of males is cut and ligated to prevent the release of sperms. In the same way, the fallopian tubules of females are cut and ligated to prevent entry of eggs. These are the permanent methods. But if the surgery is not done properly, it may lead to infections. What if the contraceptives fail and pregnancy happens? Medical termination of pregnancy. Using surgical methods to remove unwanted pregnancy is called medical termination of pregnancy or abortion. In certain sections of our society, sex selective abortion of female fetus is practiced. This leads to the disturbance of male female sex ratio in the population. What did the government do to protect the girl child from these false practices? The government has banned the prenatal sex determination. to control the misuse of medical termination of pregnancy prenatal sex determination means scanning and identification of gender of the fetus this is all about how organisms reproduce thanks for watching please like the video please share this video with your friends please subscribe to great booster channel press 